Okay, so those are some of the sort of natural processes occurring in the nitrogen cycle. But as I mentioned, humans have also perturbed the nitrogen cycle to a great extent. And in fact, humans uh, have doubled the amount of nitrogen fixation from the atmosphere, largely into terrestrial systems through a couple of different uh, means. So here on the left, you can see the sort of total amounts of nitrogen that are fixed per year due to non-human uh, sources of nitrogen fixation as opposed to the human-related forms of nitrogen fixation. And as we already talked about, um, we have fixation, biological fi fixation by in the ocean, um, which is kind of small compared to the amount of fixation occurring in terrestrial systems, and then there's a small amount occurring due to lightning. But humans have essentially just doubled the amount of nitrogen that is getting fixed each year. Um, one way we do this is unintentional, it's through the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, remember, fossil fuels are just dead organic matter that's been chemically altered a bit. Uh, but that includes things like nitrogen, uh, just as dead organic material uh, includes nitrogen. And so nitrogen um, gets fixed and will actually be deposited on systems through uh, nitrogen deposition and just acid rain of when we burn fossil fuels and nitrogen is released. Uh, but the biggest forms of nitrogen fixation from humans come through our manufacturing of fertilizer through the Haber-Bosch process. And that's shown here in green as that industrial fixation. So that's the main source of nitrogen fixation uh, that humans provide. But then there is also a substantial amount of additional fixation through our planting and using crops that are nitrogen fixers. So things like soybeans, we plant a lot of nitrogen fixing uh, plants, much more than you would find in sort of natural systems. And so that actually also leads to a pretty substantial amount of nitrogen fixation above which we would normally see in natural systems. So what happens to all this nitrogen? We put most of this nitrogen uh, onto terrestrial systems in the form of fertilizer or the planted nitrogen fixing crops. But a lot of it ends up ending in aquatic systems uh, like rivers. And this is just a graph showing that, in fact, the amount of nitrogen that we find in rivers is highly correlated with the population density at that point. So nitrate export here is the amount of nitrogen that's flowing down the river uh, per unit time. And the highest rates of nitrate are found in areas where we have the highest density of human populations. And the reason for this, of course, is if you have a lot of people, you probably have a lot of agriculture and you're probably dumping lots of fertilizer, uh, but also, especially in cities, you also have a lot of sewage disposal um, and that can also end up in the rivers and it contains a lot of nitrogen. And in our region, a lot of this nitrogen that ends up in the rivers gets transported out to the ocean. And as we talked about before, this can lead to the creation of dead zones in the ocean, which tends to be pretty nitrogen limited, that additional Nitrogen goes a long way to increase the algal production, which leads to a lot of dead organic material that uh, gets decomposed, uh, which draws down oxygen content uh, in waters where the diffusion of oxygen uh, is, is really low, and that leads to these low and anoxic regions of the water that can kill off lots of organisms. Um, and in fact, these dead zones occur throughout the world, usually at around the mouths of rivers that are probably having uh, a lot of 
nitrogen inputs from the surrounding urban or agriculture areas, all that nitrogen flows out to the ocean and we see um, some pretty serious dead zones worldwide. Now, one thing that can help uh, sort of filtering out some of this nitrogen, the nitrates before they reach the rivers and end up being moved out to the ocean, creating dead zones, uh, can be wetlands. Wetlands and riparian vegetation that are found um, along rivers, they can actually help to remove some nitrogen, in some cases phosphorus, uh, from, from the runoff before it gets into streams and rivers. So in this way, just as we talked about uh, different ecosystem act, acting as carbon sinks, wetlands and riparian ecosystems can actually act as nutrient sinks, uh, where they'll take up more nutri uh, nutrients than they'll let uh, leave. And this is considered uh, something that we call an ecosystem service, a service by an ecosystem. And it's particularly important in landscapes dominated by agriculture or urban land cover where nitrogen input from upland ecosystems is typically quite high, as we just saw. Now, why do wetlands and riparian vegetation help so much in removing nitrogen? Well, there are two reasons. The first is that these systems are often highly productive, so that means there's a lot of vegetation growing quickly, which means they have high nutrient demand, so they can uptake a lot of this nitrogen that is in nitrate form and convert it into organic material. Um, the second reason that wetlands are so critical as sort of nitrogen sinks is because they can actually do a lot of denitrification by the soil bacteria that live there. And through this process, a lot of that excess nitrate can be converted into nitrogen gas um, and return that nitrogen to the atmosphere so that it does not enter streams and rivers. So why are wetlands good environments for denitrification? Well, uh, the sediments or the soil that are waterlogged tend to often, at least in parts of these systems, be pretty low in oxygen. And remember that denitrification requires anaerobic conditions to occur. So these environments are good at sort of capturing uh, and removing nitrogen from water before it passes into rivers uh, and out to the ocean. So the nitrogen cycle, a quick summary. Uh, like the carbon cycle, there is a large atmospheric pool of nitrogen and ultimately all nitrogen in ecosystems has come from this atmospheric pool uh, where it is unavailable to most living organisms. But unlike the carbon cycle, the flux from the atmosphere to the biosphere, um, either terrestrial, marine, or aquatic is very small. So on an annual basis, very little nitrogen uh, is moving between these systems. Uh, and because of that, internal recycling of nitrogen within these ecosystems is critical for supplying the nitrogen that autotrophs will need. Now, additionally, primary producers take up nitrogen in inorganic form. And so decomposition is incredibly important in these systems. Uh, for regenerating these forms. And in any system where you have slow decomposition, it's going to lead to low nitrogen availability. And finally, nitrogen can be lost from an ecosystem by a couple of different pathways. We talked about denitrification, which is the conversion of reactive nitrogen back to uh, unreactive form of nitrogen gas. This requires anaerobic conditions. Uh, we talked a little bit about the fact that some nitrates are highly mobile and can get leached out of systems carried by water. Um, uh, that's one way an ecosystem can lose nitrogen. And then one thing we didn't talk about is the process of sedimentation. Uh, over time, if you consider things like oceans, 
just as with carbon, there is a very small loss of nitrogen into the sediments that sort of will get locked away over time. Um, but this is also a very small flux relative to, say, the internal recycling that occurs.